PS 27. In this video, I'm going to cover the lecture for this week, which is Unit 9, Chapter 9. And this week, we're going to talk about defense and death in different areas that we need to protect um, for our network infrastructure, security, for the physical facility, and looking at assets and making sure that we understand the recovery. Um, so in this week, you can check out the task. The tasks require you to read chapter 9, complete the assignment after you watch the video, and also do the lab. There is also a homework assignment in which I created another video for you to view on how to do that. And so when you downloaded the template, you can take a look at how to fill out the template, and then you can attempt the quiz. So. To begin, what we can do is we can go and download the notes and the notes that you can find that here. Again, we can take a look at defense in depth. By definition, um, it would be a practice of implementing layered security so that we would not have a single point failure. We would be able to protect our infrastructure. So in defense in depth, it would entail <clears throat> protecting assets, physical security, taking a look at the technical configuration and the technical implementation of our system, our network appliances, looking at administrative, that would be policy and human practices, and also the physical control. So in your assignment, question one asks you, what is defense in depth? And you simply can say that it is a practice of implementing several layers of protection, including administration, configuration, physical security. And so with that said, we want to look at different areas of physical security. Physical security would entail the perimeter, the facility that the company is op operating from, buildings, work areas, server rooms, network rooms, hardware, and in that we want to look at security measure for those. So in the perimeter, we can have security guards to be able to monitor the physical entrance or exiting area, the facility to protect our facility from physical damage. Um, and we can put up gates and barricades in the area where we would have sensitivity or se it would be sensitive for the operation. For the building, we can, we can have lighting, proper lighting, so that way activities, criminal activities can be um, deterred. Video cameras and surveillance system, alarm system. So those are some of the things that we can use for the building along with fire suppression and fire alarm systems and so on. Securing work areas, we would want to isolate the classified areas that would hold sensitive activities um, and we want to restrict access to those areas or to the activities. So what we want to do is we can implement locks, we can implement um, a way to log who comes in and who's leaving, um, a way to really see and monitor the people along with the systems that we're using. So for the server and the network rooms, we wanna make sure that it's locked and it has very limited access to outsiders and, or people who don't have, who shouldn't have access to the network and the server area. Um, we want we can use biometric type of entrance lock. We can use digital lock. We can use um, radio frequency type of reader to be able to manage the access to these area. And server room is should always be locked. Network room should always be locked in that it holds critical systems. It would hold connectivity to our backbone. We would have racks of switches, routers, 
along with electrical control um, and even phone type of management system. And we can use we can use hardware cabinets and lock cabinets to be able to protect our server. So they have server cabinets um, that would allow you to install all the network appliances, um, racks that would we would have enclosure for the racks. We would have equipment that we would chain and bolt down so that way it cannot just walk out of the room. And you can use air gap to isolate networks and systems so that way when an intruder is entering our network physically, they won't be able to access everything. With signs, we can control traffic and we can make sure that signs are visible for the type of traffic that we want to focus on. Um, in some cases, business won't put sign up for sensitive room in that, so that way people don't just enter the room uh, because it would hold the critical type of system. And then we want to use door locks. We can use cipher lock, electronic lock, proximity card system, biometric systems. So there are many ways now that we can actually control door locks. Um, and for entering and leaving the facility, we can implement man trap. Sometimes that would be multiple doors um, or you know the actual turn wheel and so on. So that way we can prevent people from tailgating. So physical security, that brings us to the next question. You need to identify three type of physical security control and you can mention those or you can come up with your own. So I listed guards, I listed door locks, and I listed surveillance systems. So with this, what we need to look at also is how we would protect our assets. And our assets could be people, it could be devices, it could be appliance, it could be system, it could be the building and data and much more. So in asset management, we want to track our valuable assets. So device hardware tracking is essential. Um, we would also want to look at the design for our infrastructure and our network the weakness in the design and our architecture. We want to document our assets and evaluate them in a quantified manner. So that way we can see how our assets are being used and their time of life and how that would last throughout the time of operation of the company. And in the area of mobile security, uh, mobile devices are a little bit more difficult to track, but we can set up wireless zone. We can set up how we would be able to distribute the mobile devices to the employee. So assets management is mentioned here. In the next area, what you see is for question three, it asks you to describe the importance of asset management. And it's a way for us to implement processes to protect company investment and company could invest in people, systems, data, building, and so on. Now, going back to the physical control, what we need to look at is we need to look at the environment control. So in the environment control, in environment impact disasters can happen such as earthquake, fire, tornado, hurricane, or it could be man-made. That could be bomb, it could be you know destruction, it could be attacks, and so on. So in the environmental control, we need to consider ventilation, heating, air conditioning, and usually in a large enterprise environment, you would have a system that control these appliances. And we want to make sure that we have physical protection to them, uh, barricades around them, making sure that we lock down 
um, these type and bolt down these type of systems. And then logically, if it's controlled by a, by a computer system, we want to make sure that we protect that system so that way intruder cannot just enter our network via that system. And that would pertain to the target case in the past. That's how they were able to intrude into the network using HVAC system. We can implement fire suppression. Um, so that way we would be able to stop fire from damaging our facility, our people, and our system. We can also monitor the environmental impact and we can implement fair cage, uh, cage cabling protection to and also different ways to block signal. Um, so blocking signal you can use specific antenna or you can use even glass um, fountains waterways things like that wall um, to block specific signal and if you're looking at um, interference we can find ways to shield interference especially in the area of radio frequency and if we start using more wireless devices we have to consider this is part of the environmental monitoring and protection. So in the next question, it asks you to look at the environmental control and identify some of the environmental control. We can say that we can protect HVAC. We can install appropriate fire suppression system, and that could be gas-based or water-based. So water would cause damage to a system that is plugged in, but water is human friendly compared to some of the gas suppression system where it would be dangerous for the human, but would be effective for the, the system. Um, so we have to weight the risk and, and look at the type of system that would be feasible for the cost and for protecting the appropriate assets. Then we would, also include signal interference to reduction, find ways to reduce signal interference or even block certain signal from entering a certain area. Um, so when you're looking at hospital, that's, a, that's critical because in the case where if you have MRI machines, MRI machines um, you know, require that you don't have any kind of interferences from other type of systems. So we can look at ways to shield that to have the barrier so that way the that the from the radiation machine we don't want that to also travel outside of, of of the area that it's intended for so now um going back to the notes we can look at ways to make sure that we have redundancy and redundancy is to add the duplication to the critical system component and networks Sometimes we would have a secondary line compare our connectivity uh, line to make sure that in the case if the primary go down, we have a second way to communicate. Um, and sometimes company would use satellite for that or they would use a more affordable type of connection for to the outside world. So redundancy just allows us to have a secondary way to make sure that we keep the business going. Fault tolerance addresses the critical component fault. So if you identify the fault and you want to be able to build a solution to address that fault, something like data loss because of hardware fault, then we want to have maybe a good tested hardware as a secondary backup or we can look at the fault in our networks where you if you have a single point failure like somebody can attack uh, our main router and take us down or attack a firewall that's going to open up our network then if you look at that fault we want to be able to think of ways to make sure that we are above that we want to be able to stop that fault from occurring 
So a big area for this is going to be data, and we can use this redundancy known as RAID to make sure that our data is duplicated, it's backed up, it's saved. Uh, so in the case we need it, we can recover. And we can also use failover server clusters. Those are the type of servers that would be used in the main, in the in the case that the main servers are down. We can have power redundancy generator, uh, uninterrupted power supply, and we can also have secondary sites in so that way we can go and operate in the case if our site is being damaged by fire, earthquake, or even man-made type of disasters. So hot sites would have all the systems in place. It would, we would then put the people there and they would be able to pick up the operation. A cold site would be just a building with bare minimum. There would not be furniture or much of, a, of any system. So then we would have to furnish and also add the system that we need and cold site is a lot more affordable than hot site to maintain over time. With the warm site, you would have a, a number of systems there and maybe people to be able to manage it, but it won't be as um, available as the hot site. And company would use mobile site in that they would use um, trucks or large vehicle to store communication systems, servers, um, equipment, appliances, so that way they can transfer it from one city to the next or one state to another state. So in the case of disaster, and you see this being used by telecommunication company like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, etc. And what we want to address is a single point failure and single point failure is the one area that can cripple your network or your system a component within the system that can cause the entire system to fail and in the case that that component fails so if you're looking at that one area what can you do to make sure that you resolve that um, we want to make sure that we have backup of everything we want to make but then again we have to consider the cost and the resources that will be contributed to that so in the assignment for number five, it asks for redundancy solution in an organization. And we can have failover server clusters. We can have generator um, or UPS and we can have RAID. And failover servers doesn't have to also always be physical server. We can always virtualize the environment so that way we can save costs. Um, or we can even have cloud um, services for our secondary infrastructure and depending on the choice of the company how they want to maintain the resources over time how much money they wanted to spend on that okay now with raid in before we answer this question we should look into raid explanation here and raid stands for redundant array of inexpensive disk it's a group of this drive, hard disk drive, that's used to write data. And often it's used for backup data. Um, so now a regular computer would use maybe a couple disks. But in, in the case of an enterprise, we would use uh, large sets of disks to be able to write our data. So when we're looking at transportation company like um, for plane, for train, for buses, um, those type of company would always need additional redundancy for their data. So we have different level of RAID. RAID zero is would use two or more disks. So you would start with at least two physical disks and the data is striped across the disk. So it would write between this one and this two and back and forth. Now, in the case, if one of the disk drive fail, then you would still lose your data. So you want to use more than two, but 
rate zero is designed to write quickly for performance. Rate one, we would mirror the data where the data is duplicated. So if I write file one on one disk, it would then be duplicated on the second disk. And in rate one, you would have two or more disks. And rate five, you would require to have at least three drives and it would stripe together like RAID 0, so it write across all three drives. So in the case if one drive fail, you would still have some data, but two drive fail, you would then lose your data. RAID 6 is an extension of RAID 5. It includes parity block and it would require at least three drives. It would then operate if one drive fails, but if you have two or more drive fail, you would have data corruption. But the rate six, the, the caveat in rate six is that it would have parity block, which checks for error writing. Rate 10 is a combination of one and zero, and many organizations choose rate 10 in that it would be fast and it would have duplicate of data. Now, the downside in RAID 1 and RAID 10 in that when you duplicated your data, if you have one drive that's one terabyte and a second drive that's another terabyte, so a total of two terabyte, in RAID 1 and RAID 10, the maximum capacity of your data is only 50% of your total drive. So in the case where we have two terabyte total, we can only write up to one terabyte because it duplicated the data so you just have the same data twice okay so rate 10 the downside of that is that your capacity is 50 percent along with rate one so when we come back to the assignment when we answer question six what is rate and which level of rate is recommended for a college like moreno valley college we RAID is a redundant array of inexpensive disks. It's a group of disks that's used for data writing or backup. Um, and the and it's old technology, it's not new, but it's still being used. Now, RAID 10 would be the recommendation for an institution like Moreno Valley College where they have grades and they have um, attendance and they would have student records and so on that would be frequently updated and courses information right so rate 10 would be recommended for institutions that re require fast writing along with duplicate of data for redundancy next we are going to go over some additional information about um, redundancy so you shouldn't have just a single server even with the one physical single server that would cause the issue power we want to make sure that power is not going to be the point of interruption so we can use an interrupted power supply generator solar base um, type of power sources to make sure that we have a secondary power sources because all our system use require elec uh, electric electricity so we want to make sure that we have that in place load balancer allows you to optimize and distribute data loads so you don't have bottleneck or you don't have slowdown in your network so across the computer so it would load balance your traffic especially when you have heavy traffic in your business. Um, and the old way to do this is to use the round robin where it would pass across, right, multiple systems. So you can have each request is being served by separate server. And then we want to talk about backups. And backup is a critical area for security because we want to make sure that the data it can be available and data is an assets data is expensive and it 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 has a lot of really important um it highly impacts the way business operates so backup 
is just a copy of the data to make sure that the original data would be duplicated. So in the case, if the original data is corrupted, we would then have the resources to put the data back. And you always want to start with a full backup. And full backup is completely backup everything on the system. Um, and in any case, we would start with the full backup. Then we can select the differential backup. And differential backup only backup the data that has been changed since the full. So if I, if Sunday, if I back up everything for my business on Monday, I can do a differential. And in the differential, it's only going to be the Monday data because the new data that was added or modified. In incremental backup, we would also need to start with the full. And then we would back up the data that has been changed since the last full and the in or the incremental. So in the incremental backup, we would start with the full. And that would happen on Sunday, let's say. And on Monday, we would do an incremental backup with backs up from the full. Then on Tuesday, we would then have an incremental backup and it would check the last incremental, which is on Monday. And in backup, we often create images or snapshots of the system, which entail applications, data, configurations, everything that's needed to put that system back to the original state or the state that it should be in the current, current time. Then with backup, we don't just backup. We would test it and make sure that the files are going to be um, usable in the case we need to recover because if we don't test that file can be corrupted and when we need it it will not be available and we cannot put our system back to in place we would want to physically protect our backup so if you back it up to a hard drive and we want to make sure that we protect it so we want to label it we wanted to put it into a fireproof area we might even want it to secure it and send it off site um, and we after we use it we wanted to properly destroy it because that data can fall into the wrong hands and we want to consider off-site backup using cloud company um, purchasing the services so that way we can put our data in in the area they can store it for us we can also consider off-site in up in outside of the country in some cases and the you know, the consideration of this is going to be impact with legal, the contract on if they lose our data, what would happen? How would they cover that? Is there insurance behind it? Um, because then it, it we would have to look at the liability aspect along with the distance and how data protection and privacy is also of concern. Okay. So to answer the next question, when we're looking at number seven, um, it asks what type of backup is suitable for a small local retail store that opens 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on Monday through Sunday. So that means they open seven days a week. So we would start with the full backup and some company would do backup throughout the day, but that can be very costly in that you have to put your other servers into place to back up your existing server because backup does require that you pull all the data and so if you're still writing data to the existing server that could be inefficient to do the backup so most of the time we would do backup after business hours and in this case we can do a backup at 10 p.m on sunday that will be a full then subsequently we can do the differential backup <coughs> of the following day. Now, the downside of this is if something occurs in the middle of the day or sometime throughout Monday, you do lose the data of the beginning of the day or the day of before, of after from the point that it backs up. Um, so therefore, some company would do it throughout the day. Now, if you, you can also have the incremental following the full backup. 
But if you do the differential, you're only going to back up the changes since the full, and that allows us to save some costs in the disk or the storage um, overall. Then next, we're going to talk about business continuity elements. And so earlier, we, I mentioned that there are outages that could cause by accidents, disasters that could be natural or man-made. And so we need to take a look at the, the disasters uh, and how that would impact the business operations, such as fire attacks, power outages, data loss, um, hardware failures, software failures, or even you know other type of natural disasters. Then and man-made disasters. So it's important that we frequently and by compliance, you would need to also do business impact analysis annually. So we would do business impact analysis to take a look at our critical process and our system. And it's, that's why we would have an assignment on it this week. So I want to make sure you know how to do it. And BCP stands for Business Continuity Plan. And Business Continuity Plan is a plan that would entail business impact analysis, it would entail disaster recovery plan, it would entail um, backup plan on how we would be able to bounce back in the case something happens. So how, are, how is our business going to be able to continue in the case of disruption? So it would identify the critical system in business impact analysis the components that are essential to our operation. And we would want to include scenarios that we would know. Um, so in the case, if we operate within a high risk for fire or a tornado or whatnot, we would then include the scenario so that we will be aware and know what to do to solve. So then, for the critical system and the function, so first we would list the processes that would be based on the business mission. Then we would identify the critical system systems based on those functions. Then we would address the dependencies on those systems um, and what is the minimum or the maximum downtime that would limit that system in our operation. Okay, so for example, if you're looking at a retailer store, um, the critical systems, so their function would be selling to the consumer, selling product to the consumer, to the customer. Um, and the critical system would be the point of sale systems, the sales terminal, um, the, the database for their product, transactional database, and so on. So you would then need to assess and rank those systems and look at the downtime, um, how that would be tolerable, what is the maximum downtime that would be tolerated for those systems. So then you would look at the potential loss and how that would be impacting your organization. So in the next question, we wanted to answer for number eight what should you do to protect your backup media we can put it in lock cabinet we can send it off site we can test the backup periodically and to make sure it works for number nine we want to compare and contrast your recovery point objective and your recovery time objective so that's what we're going to talk about next is going to be after your BIA. So in your recovery, you need to consider these things. Your recovery time objective is the maximum amount of time that would take you to restore a system, whether to fix it, to replace it, etc. The recovery point objective is the data point that would tie to time where the data is lost is acceptable. So let's say that we go back to the scenario with the retailer store. If 
if I do a backup on Sunday with a fool and I perform a differential on Monday, but earlier in that day, let's say at 12 p.m., uh, my server failed because of hardware. So what happens is I need to replace that server and I need to restore all the data on that server. So I did lose some data sometime earlier that day. However, the downtime for that server, let's say that if it is a, pro a server that holds all our product information, what is the maximum downtime is gonna be the amount of time to replace that server. But the recovery point objective to put that server back in place it will be since the last backup, which is the full backup on Sunday. Now, the mean time between failures is gonna be represented as the average or the mean time from the last time that it failed. So if, if we're looking at a system that fails, let's say in January of the year, and eight months later, it fails again, so then we would look at the average time, the average mean time, the average time between the failure. So that would be from one to the next failure. So over time, we want to accumulate that data and look at how long in between is the amount of time that in between the fails. So the, the mean time for recovery is the average or the mean time to restore a failed system. So what would be the amount of time to recover? So if we look at a server, the first time that it failed, it took us eight hours to recover. The second time it fails, it took us two hours to recover. The third time it fails, it took us 10 hours to recover. So we would calculate those and we would get an average. So eight plus two plus 10 gives us 20 hours. And that would be divided by the three times that it fails. So you would get roughly six point something hours in the average for the mean time to recover for that server. So in the next question, we can answer the recovery time objective identifies the maximum amount of time that it would take to restore a system after the outage. And the recovery point objective, usually point back to the last backup, identifies the point of time where the data loss is acceptable. So make sure that we distinguish between RPO and RTO. And you will likely see a lot of these questions on your quiz, your final exam, and even your certification for security. And then for number 10, we said that the MTBF, which is the mean time between failure, is the, to measure system reliability and represent it as the average mean time that it stays up right between the failures. The mean time recover is going to be the average time that it takes to restore the system or repair the system. And you can also reference the notes on this. So our goal is to make sure that our operation continues and we want to focus on our mission functions or your business, your business missions and processes. We want to look at how we can recover using recover site, <clears throat> using ways to back up our data. So in, in defense in depth is really means that we have to look beyond just configuring networks and monitoring networks. We have to look at the physical, the administration, other areas of control to make sure that we have layered security. Disaster recovery plan is your DRP and it's part of the BCP, which is your business continuity plan. And this address how you can recover from the disaster. And so we need to really identify the impacting disasters and 
the processes on how to go about recovering from an attack, from a malware, from people leaking data, from fire that destroy our server room, from floods that destroy all our system, from human error, from a lot of different areas. So when this plan would hold different scenario, it would list the critical systems and the people who would be able to restore those system and once the, the DRP is activated. So it is a contingency plan on how to move forward with alternate sites and, and the recovery solutions. So we wanna make sure that we test it and we test the, the recovered system to make sure that the critical data is put in place and we would write a report to review how we can improve for future purposes, okay? So we need to test the plan, we need to look at backup, we need to look at how servers are restored, and we need to make sure that we maintain and monitor the alternate sites. So that's important as part of your DRP. So in question 11, it asks you, why is the DRP important for business? Why is disaster recovery plan important in a business? Because it contains procedures and resources that are needed when a disaster occur. And the business would rely on disaster recovery plan to recover and return to the daily operation. So it's like having an emergency plan at home and you would have that plan out with your family members so that way you would know exactly what to do in case of emergency. So then with this, we would see that all of these areas would be part of what we would see the solution for the defense and death. And this concludes my unit nine lecture. Please watch the lab and the homework two instructions lecture. Um, and if you have any questions, please contact me and let me know. Thank you very much for watching the video.